We're back. It's Wildlife Aid talking from Randall's farmhouse in Leatherhead. It's seven o'clock and we're live on YouTube. So get your questions coming, guys. We're here, we're ready. We've got some questions already from you, so thank you very much indeed. Um, <coughs> and we're still in the middle of our busiest season, so middle of summer and uh, it's all systems go. So any first questions coming up, Laurie? Laurie just actually dropped the, nearly dropped the celeb light on Abby. The whole celeb light went down, about £3,000 worth. Absolute chaos, 30 seconds before we started. But never mind. We caught it, it's fine. <coughs> Ish. Uh, got a number of different questions that we've got coming in at the moment. Um, just flicking through. So Armpit First has asked, how big is the hospital? How many sort of sheds and buildings do we have? I've absolutely no idea. When we started, it was one shed, which was about eight feet by six feet. And now there's lots of sheds and lots of pens. Um, <coughs> it covers about half an acre of land. Uh, we've got probably over 300 pens. We've got, in fact, two hospital units and all the subsidiary units go with it, the reception and all the other type of things. So it's a bit like a TARDIS. When you come in the front gate, you think, oh, this isn't very big. And it seems to go on and on and on and on and on. So it's a bit like the TARDIS and it's getting bigger every day. Rather like my tummy, really. <laughs> That's not entirely true. You're basically two-dimensional. Um, Minmage35 has asked, why haven't uh, I seen any raccoon or skunk rescues on the show? Sadly, in the UK, we don't have many raccoons and skunks. What we do have is I'm hearing myself about five seconds after I talk, so we're going to ask... Music. No, we're going to ask Abby and Laurie to somehow cut it somewhere on a speaker. I'm hearing myself twice. Very scary. Um, no, raccoons and rescues aren't in the UK, <coughs> so we don't get any of those. Um, I've actually never rescued either when I've been abroad either, but it would be quite fun to do so. So, sorry guys, none of those in the UK. <laughs> uh, on the same thing, we had a question earlier, sorry, I can't remember who asked it. Um, they asked, do we only get foxes, deer, badgers and hedgehogs in the UK, or do we have quite a variety of species? We've got a massive variety of species in it. In the UK, obviously, the most common animals we get are those which will integrate with man. They do come into urban areas. So, yes, we get foxes, we get badgers, we get deer. And there are other creatures out there, but luckily they're nice and shy. They don't come too near to people, and we don't have to deal with them too often. <laughs> um, on the same sort of topic, we've got <coughs> Tails, the two-tailed fox, has asked, why do we rescue so many foxes? Foxes really are in trouble in the UK, as it, I mean, all British wildlife's in trouble. All of it's in decline. Some of it's uh, very near and close to extinction. But any animal that comes in and has to really survive because of mankind comes into urban areas, we see more of them. And obviously foxes are, like all animals, they're opportunist hunters. And people have waste bins, so they come into urban areas. The urban areas have more houses, they have more roads. So consequently, it's always an interaction of man with animals that cause the problem. We're taking away their habitat and they're having to eke out their existence in a much smaller space than they used to only probably 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, we've got Byron Hawke who's asked, with all the negative <coughs> stories about seagulls, mostly herring gulls... There is no such thing as a seagull! There are so over 50 species of gulls in the world and none of them are called seagulls. So we've got herring gulls, all sorts of gulls. Um, uh, but what was the question? Because I've gone right <laughs> You've off that. Completely track. gone off. I it. have gone off it. Uh, the question was: Do we still help gulls in need of medical attention, despite all the negative press? We help any animal that needs our help. Basically, any wild animal that is. We don't believe in being species specific. If and let's face it, ninety-five, probably even ninety-nine percent of the animals that we see here at the centre are directly due to man. So we're just trying to redress the balance, all the damage we do. If we can redress that balance, that's fine. And I don't think we have the right to be species specific. So we will take any animal that needs help, even if we don't like it that much, but we do like most of them, I hasten to add. <laughs> uh, we've had, amazingly, we've had a couple of donations already um, since being online, just for a couple of minutes. So Viv E has donated five pounds and has put, hello and thank you for rescuing so many animals. XX for everyone in your team. So thank you very much. Uh, Linda Harwood. I don't think Laurie deserves any XXs. No. 
He nearly dropped the celeb light, as I said earlier. No X's for Laurie tonight, guys. I caught it. But keep the, only because you nearly dropped it, but keep the donations coming. <laughs> Honestly, they make all the difference. I mean, you might think, oh, it's not very much, it's only a pound. But let's face it, every pound we get will probably save an animal's life or it will certainly feed something like a hedgehog or a bird for a day. So don't think a pound's too small and never, ever think that a million pound is too big. <laughs> Uh, more donations. We've got Linda Harwood has donated ten US dollars, so thank you very much. Well, with and the way things are going with Brexit at the moment, the, U the US dollar and now. sterling are parity, so that's ten pounds. Thank you very much <laughs> indeed. Although we're all crying here in England, but let's not get political tonight. Um, Leonor Revo has donated twenty one ninety nine in euros and has put love your work. So thank you very much to all of you. Um, and the euro on. also is parity with the pound, so the, pound, one one the pound is in big trouble at the moment, guys. So thank you for every single pound, euro, dollar, or anything we get. Uh, Oryx has asked, have you ever felt a particular connection with any of the animals that you've rescued at all? To be honest, when you're in rescue mode and you're out there doing it, you feel a connection every time. Sometimes you're a bit scared, you're a bit nervous. But you have to really get in tune with the animal. To be a successful rescuer, you can't just go pounding in without thinking about it. You might have to go in fast sometimes. Often on rescues, it's one step forward, two steps back some of the time. You've got to feel that rescue. You've got to be in tune with that animal. So there is a connection. I, For me, every time I do any rescue, there is a connection. Um, Lindsay's asked, um, what's the single best change someone can make to their garden to help wildlife? Oh, there's so many changes. I mean, for single, it depends whether it's a big thing or a little thing. If you just plant a little area of wildflowers, that will bring in the pollinators. Um, if you cut a hole in your fence that's over about uh, 15 or 20 centimetres square, that will let a hedgehog in. Um, in fact, I've got to check that distance because I forget how big the hole's got to be. So hold that thought, we will find out for you. Abby will diligently search that in a second. Um, so yeah, the changes can be anything. Obviously, when you're, if you're putting in a new fence or something, just be aware that wildlife can get caught in it. Chain link fence is very dangerous. If you have netting for your fruits or your flower beds or whatever, please make sure it's off the ground. You can do the tiniest thing to make a big difference. Even just leaving a patch of nettles in a corner somewhere all helps animals survive. The invertebrates are really the backbone of all the creatures we have. Everybody wants to save the big animals, the elephants, the tigers, all the big beautiful things. But actually, if we lose the bottom end of the food chain, um, then we will slowly lose everything all the way up the food chain, including man. So I do harp on a bit globally and a bit planetly at the moment, but we can't do it all. I wish we could. It'd be fantastic to cure all the problems we've got. We have so many problems. If everybody just focus on their bit they do well and we focus on saving British wildlife and obviously preaching and talking to people about the necessity to keep habitat intact. So just the littlest change in your garden can actually make a massive difference. And obviously in the UK at the moment, it's very warm, particularly in the south of England. So when you get a real warm spell, a low bowl of water very securely so it can't tip for the, for the mammals and a, a water bowl up high for the birds would be great. Just keep them clean, don't let them get too dirty because obviously infection does sometimes come. So just do things, be a bit thoughtful and just leave a bit of a wild patch in your garden, that would be really great. Um, so the hedgehog holes in the fences can be 13 centimetres by 13 centimetres. I wasn't that far out, guys. Right? 30. <laughs> Um, Abby obviously only knows dieting hedgehogs, so that's 13 centimetres. <laughs> if you've got an obese hedgehog, you might have to go up to 20 centimetres. But yeah, no, anything about that sort of size. Hedgehogs, really, the biggest area they have in the southeast now are people's back gardens. And they don't want to be confined to any one garden because they can't go out and find food. They can't go out and find a mummy hedgehog if you're a daddy hedgehog or a daddy hedgehog if you're a mummy hedgehog. So they need to travel. Hedgehogs can go two or three kilometres a night if they want to. Um, give them the space to do that and any other animals that, that come in, it's all great. Animals need to, to move, they need corridors and the biggest well, corridors we have in the UK or in the south of the UK are people's back gardens. Uh, so we've had a couple more donations come in. So Karen has donated 4 99 US dollars uh, and Bunny Umptious has donated 5 euros and has put someone please get Simon a drink of water. 
<laughs> he does have Diet Coke. He doesn't drink anything else. Uh, and then we'll I just can't tell you why I don't drink water. It's a joke here, but I'm never allowed yes, to use it. And Laurie threatens to, to kill that. me if I use my normal term. <laughs> but I need a couple of drinks before I tell people that. I'm sorry, my throat's a bit sore tonight, um, but I'm absolutely fine. Uh, we've also had a donation from an Adam <coughs> Warner, who is Abby's husband, who's donated £5. So thank you, Adam. Adam, was that so we got Abby in front of the camera for five minutes? I think a pound a minute's about fair. Abby's just fallen on the desk. She is going to kill Abby you. Abby is going to... Don't kill me. Adam's the one. Adam, you did it, Adam. Thank <laughs> you very much, young man, for your donation. Abby is very grateful, although she's hiding in the corner. And if I could have a bit of light on her and not on me, we'd probably see she was blushing. She's turned... She's, she's a bit narky today. Be Abby. nice. I'm always nice <laughs> to Abby. Always. A uh, couple more donations. Pavel has donated £50, pounds, so thank you very much. I nearly said a swear word. Thank you very much. That was that's amazing. <laughs> incredible. That's amazing. Absolutely incredible. The donations are flying in, so thank you so much. We need guys. a bit of flying. Do you realise now we've had 140, or just short of 140 million views? And I was working out and I was sitting at my desk this afternoon. If everybody who watched once gave us a pound, we'd have 114 million pounds. If everybody donated just 10p, that would be 11 million pounds. And everybody donated just one P per view, one little P per view, that would be a million pounds. Somehow we need to monetize YouTube. We need to get the funds coming because we need it. If you run a corporate company that, you know, you get bigger, you get better, you sell more product, you have a better service, you make more money, everybody's happy. Running a charity is really, it, it blows the head sideways because every time you get more successful, it actually costs you more money to run. So we would have more money if we shut the doors and just sat here doing nothing, twiddling our thumbs, which none of us would like doing. So somehow, guys, if you can think of any ways of monetizing YouTube, we'd love to know them because your donations help thousands of animals. And if we could go just that bit further, we've got a new venture coming up very shortly of building a brand new center on 20 acres, which is a six and a half million pound project plus. It sounds so little, if everybody gave us a pound in the UK, that would be done. It would be so easy to do it. Um, sadly, it's not coming yet, but any bright ideas, anybody wins the lottery, will be ever so nice to you, if you give us a bit of it. Uh, more donations yet again. Oh, heavens above. David has donated 10 US dollars and has put, this is for my four-year-old daughter, Ariela, who is enthralled in your work. Thanks for the great work and the infinite inspiration. So thank you very much. That's a lovely thing. You're to both say. very lovely. Big kisses for your daughter. I think we're still allowed to do this in this very weird PC world. So big kiss for your daughter and a handshake for you. I won't go further than that, but that's <laughs> great. Thank you. Uh, Zach has also donated 14.99 in British pounds and has put thank you for everything you do. Also, Laurie, you're cute. So <laughs> I, I may recommend an eye test after that one, but thank you very much. Anybody who thinks Laurie's cute should be giving at least 100 pounds because I have to work with him every single day and put up with him. Pop every black. single day. <laughs> but there again, when I see a big tall tree and there's a rescue, I really like Laurie because those trees are way past me now. But I do worry about him. I actually bought him two brand new safety lines for his climbing the other day because I'm terrified one day he's going to free climb and not have a safety line. So we do look after him a little bit. Um, and he is brilliant at rescues. He's done ever so well this year um, on some really, really dramatic rescues, including, which we won't mention again now, but it is on the YouTube channel, uh, the most probably the most dangerous rescue we've ever done in 40 years, which was the swan. 70 feet up a tree. I'll say no more. Watch the video. Um, Lindsay has asked, how frustrating are the bird in warehouse rescues? <clears throat> They're quite fun, really. Um, they are frustrating because I just, you know, the bird hasn't got the sense to come down and go out of the door. We did another one this week. We've done quite a few this year already. And some take a long time, some take a short time. In fact, Somebody should remain nameless, but we did let somebody else run one of the rescues a few months ago uh, in a warehouse, and it took us seven hours. And Laurie and I went to rescue a bird in a warehouse this week, and it took us half an hour. I will say no more, but sometimes old age and experience counts. <laughs> uh, so just flicking back through some of the questions, uh, we've got LaDonna who has asked, um, do we charge for our services or do we just get the donations from the people we help? There's so many naughty answers I could answer that, but of course I won't because this is live TV nearly, live YouTube. Um, no, we don't charge. 
obviously donations would be great. In fact, we were sitting in a going to rescue the other day, which was not that far away, but the traffic was really bad. So we spent an hour going to this rescue, driving an hour driving back, and we just worked out in petrol alone that probably cost us about thirty pounds. And not everybody gives us a donation. Some people are very generous, but I don't think people think they think that obviously we're funded by the government or funded by somebody. So we're just doing the job we're paid to do. Um, most of it is done by volunteers, very few paid members of staff, and obviously, again, every penny counts. You've been so generous tonight, I'm shattered. I'm going to break into song soon. Now, that could be very dangerous and would make you take all your donations back. But it's, it's difficult. You know, every rescue we do probably costs us, excluding salaries or staff or anything else, probably 20 or 30 pounds. So, you know, it, it's, it's why I say running a charity is always a huge challenge. But it's one we continue to rise to. And when I finally die, Laurie will be in the hot seat. And God help us all. <laughs> uh, even more donations in. Nils Norman has donated 10 US dollars and has written, thank you for your work. So thank you very much. Uh, and Bunny the Bear has donated two pounds and has written, what's your most memorable rescue? Now, I know this is one we've answered before. a million before. times. It's the one I remember at the time, to be honest. Um, I can't think of a really memorable one any more than any other. There's just been hundreds of them. I love the deer in the gates because it's so tragic and horrible and then the deer will run off and find mum and everybody's happy. Or you let a fox go and you let it out of the cage and it runs off down the road and turns and looks back at you. I have a million and one memories, which is why I wrote my first book, which is The Owl with the Golden Heart. Uh, no, Owl's Dream. Owl with Golden Heart? Owl. Owl. Look, I'm going to give you a I'm going to hold it up because we're just about to get a tenth anniversary edition yeah. this is the old one guys this is the one that went out about 10 years ago abby is working hard to produce a new one of these because these are getting a bit old and, and falling to bits now but if you read this this is what our work is all about really if you want to get to the real me um it's probably about as close as you'll get to my soul as you'll ever get because it's sort of written for seven-year-olds my brain thinks as a seven-year-old can't think of anything bigger no big words in here i hasten to add but it, it's basically what we do through the animal's eyes, and there will be a new edition out of this probably within a few months, I hope. Yes. Yeah. Abby says yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we've had a question about the, the fire that we had uh, in the 90s. They've asked, how long did it take you to recover both your, your sort of motivation and <coughs> the centre after that happened? Um, the fire was pretty traumatic. It was sort of, you know, from nothing to a massive inferno in about six seconds. And we actually, later we played it back and we watched it on CCTV because we had cameras all around the centre. And it was so quick that it went from nothing to a raging inferno. At the time, we were just working on adrenaline. I mean, we were pulling animals out of cages, moving them, putting birds in with animals that would normally eat each other and they were as good as gold. Everything just sat and, and let us do what we had to do. I think the low time was probably, it took us about three days to get really low. We lost the badger to the fire. We, we got him out, we dug him out, and he was looked if he was going to be all right, but he was suffering from really serious smoke inhalation. And he died probably a couple of days later, and that was probably the low point when I felt like giving it up. Um, even the next morning when we went up with the uh, fire brigade came back, they'd been brilliant the night before they came back when their shift ended and helped us clear up. So that was all pretty damned amazing. And that was all very adrenaline driven. It's when you sort of sit back and it all sinks in a bit, that it all gets a bit heavy. But you know, you've only got to look at an animal's face that needs rescuing and you can't give up. I mean, I say to everybody regularly here, I whinge about this place and what I do every single day of my life and I would not change it for the world. So I will whinge and whinge and whinge, but uh, I'll be doing it tomorrow and the next day. <laughs> Amazingly, we've had yet more donations coming. I love tonight. I'm going to yeah. sing a song oh, very just, shortly. Just wait, just wait. You will need to sing a song. Uh, so we've had Ready to Go has donated four ninety nine in US dollars and has written, Love your care and compassion for all wildlife. Uh, Jason Mayer, who's uh, quite a regular uh, on our social media, has donated 20 US dollars and has written, Hi Simon, another donation from me. I think £20 feeds a badger for a day. Oh, no, it feeds a bit more than the badger for a day. I think probably 20 pounds feeds about five badgers for a day, at least, to be honest. It'll feed a hedgehog, a pound will feed a hedgehog for a day. Um, but our badgers don't eat too many hedgehogs because they're a bit prickly. <laughs> so we tend to feed them other things. And we've had 
Another 100 euro donations from Sven. That is 100 euros every single live stream that we've done so far. So that is absolutely incredible. Thank you so when much. Where Sven live? Where does Sven live? We need to meet Sven. Uh, so Sven? FXP1688, can that you just let us no. know in the comments roughly uh, whereabouts you're based? Come and see us. Come and visit us. If you bring a check for a million quid, you can come and visit us twice. <laughs> no, thank you so much. I mean, it really mean, it means so much to us. I mean, we get our kicks from the animals when you say them that that's our thanks. That's all we need. But it needs you to support us to do this work. So everything makes me quite quite tearful when I think of all the all the things people do for us to get us where we are today. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and then a couple more. We've got Kerry Stevens, who's donated ten pounds. And put, hope it helps. Thank you very much for all you guys do to save our wildlife. It helps an incredible deal. So thank you very much, Kerry. Uh, and Suzanne has donated 10 euros. So thank you very much once again. This is a money data. We've never had it so is. much money rolling it's in. It's incredible. It's really incredible. Thank you so much for your support, guys. I might be able to go on holiday this year, yeah? <laughs> a day in Brighton. So Armpit Fuzz has written, is there anything they can do to encourage hedgehogs into the garden? <clears throat> Basically, I spoke to a chap the other day who'd never seen a hedgehog. He'd been living in this property for 20 or 30 years and he happened to spill some food out one day and in came a hedgehog. You might well have hedgehogs. If you live in a very badger populated area, you're less likely to have hedgehogs. But if you've got lots of slugs and snails, which again is why you should leave a little bit of your garden sort of natural and wild, it would encourage them in. Um, if you feed every now and then just to see what comes in at night that's fine but you're obviously going to encourage the rodents as well so you have to have a little bit of a balance there there's not much you can do to be honest you would be surprised the wildlife you do have that you've probably never seen so i think i always think it's great even if you just borrow one from a friend to put out a trophy a trial camera for a night um, just put it in the garden on the lawn and leave a bit of food around and you'll be surprised what wildlife comes in to eat you could get a big surprise and find you've got a big fat prickly hedgehog. <laughs> uh, so we've actually got Lucy, our old vet nurse in the chat. Oh, she's, said, she's past it now, Lucy. Don't <laughs> but, you think so? She must be very old now, uh, Lucy. She, she said Sean was always very good at the warehouse. Oh, Sean was, Sean was just, he was just a show off. <laughs> he just was a show off. The only time I really enjoyed a rescue was Sean. We had, um, I think it was a duck of some sort stuck in the middle of a pond in Ashdod and the pond was about six feet deep of silt. And, you know, I looked at that pond and I thought, okay, I can make sure Sean gets to that pond first. He'll go in and I won't have to. Bless his cotton socks, he went into this pond. He was really up to his, his mid chest in this pond. And when he came out the other end of the pond with this duck, which he rescued, Sean will never give up on a rescue ever. I've never known such perseverance. He was not only black, but he stank more than normal. And very fortunately, as we were doing all this, there was a garage literally right across the road and they were using a steam cleaner on a car outside. And we walked over to the garage and I said to the guy, can I borrow your steam cleaner? So we steam cleaned Sean at the end of the rescue. I think actually it's on one of our videos somewhere, but Sean is an amazing man and he actually is probably more tenacious at rescues than I am. Um, but uh, both Sean and Lucy are useless. They don't work with us anymore. Um, they're too busy swanning around the world. So they just don't care about us really. It's all just talk. It's all just talk. Um, talking about rescues, Marlis has asked, um, is there any equipment that you find essential for rescues? What do you use the most? Uh, we use everything. I mean, to be honest, if you can't afford some of the kit, you can make it. It's not, my favourite expression is it's not rocket science, but there's another word in when I use it. It's not rocket science. I mean, if you wanted to make a quick grasper, if you get an old, old hollow aluminium broom handle, you go and buy some of that very thin, thick wire which is padded in plastic you put it round the end of the broom or through the broom handle round the end back on the outside you can make yourself a grasper graspers are expensive they're about 100 pounds each but you can make something very easily we carry basic kit i mean i suppose most of our kit comprises some very long poles quite strong because they're going to get used and then you have to bend them a swan hook some nets you don't need an awful lot of kit to be honest and a lot of it you can improvise and make what you need we a lot of the time need something we've never used before so we just improvise what we have a bit of gaffer tape and a bit of imagination 
goes a long way. And if Laurie's talking too much, the gaffer tape's even more useful. <laughs> Honestly, please help. <laughs> um, Kayla Dex has asked, uh, you, we, you went to Africa during the Wildlife SOS series. What animal over there would you have loved to bring back to the UK and work with over here? Uh, none. Um, wild animals are in the wild where they belong. They should never be moved. I had so much, I was so privileged and so lucky to see them. I think the most, the most amazing thing probably ever, the most funny thing which I talk about a lot of the time is we went on our very first trip and we went down to Zambia um, and we were driving in, the, they picked us up at the airport and we put all the kit in the back of the Land Rover and we got to the edge of Luangwas National Park and as we went across the bridge there was a hippopotamus about a mile away in the water we said to the driver, stop, stop, stop. So we got all the kit out, put the tripods up, got the cameras out. We were filming this hippo about a mile away and this guy, the driver, was looking at us as if we were totally insane. But it was the first one I'd ever seen in the wild. So we did all that, very pleased with ourselves. We got back in the vehicle, the driver just sort of went, rolled his eyes and we drove off down the road. And within 50 feet, a lion just walked straight past the side of our vehicle. <laughs> we just stood there with our, or sat there with our mouths open, um, and then we saw wildlife very up close and personal, and it was just magical. I will, I, one day, I hope before I die, one of my bucket list things would be to go back and do another safari, because seeing wildlife in the wild doing what it does without too many threats from man is just stunning, and that is my that was my magic, and it will continue to live in my mind forever. But we'd seen some great things all over in the world and I've been so lucky to see it. And you never know, one day I might get to do it again if somebody commissions us for a new TV series, anybody out there, any commissioning editors, we will give you a series that would knock your socks off. I'll try not to swear, I'll try not to be too senile, but you know, I've still got it in me guys. I can still go some more miles yet. And <laughs> um, when you were first starting off the, the rescue centre, did you ever, uh, ever consider becoming training to become a vet? Always wanted to be a vet from when I was at school. Putting it in a nutshell, far too academically challenged. <laughs> Brain cells not big enough or retentive, retentive enough to be a vet. Um, would I like to be a vet now? Sort of. Um, I would not like to sit and do domestics all the time because it would drive me mad. I think the challenge of getting a wild animal where you don't really know the history, with even as a vet on domestic animals, you know a bit of the history of that animal. We are having mental challenges every day trying to work out what happened to the wildlife that got hurt and why. Um, so I think I've probably got a better world in a way. I don't earn as much money as a vet, but I love what I do. As I say, I whinge about it every day. And if somebody wants to pay, pay me a couple of million quid to keep the centre going, I'm your man. <laughs> uh, so Sven has actually replied. Sven, where do you live, young man? He said he'll be in the UK shortly in September. I might be dead by then, Sven. That's a <laughs> long time away. Um, where does he, does he say where he lives? Uh, no, not at all. Is he being secretive? Uh, he, he will be in the UK in September. So Sven, please could you just drop us an email? Um, drop it to media, M-E-D-I-A, at wildlifeaid.org.uk. And we'll see what we can do there. Need to meet you, young man. Thank you very much. Um, I think you come from Area 51. I've got a feeling you come from Area 51. Speaking of donations, uh, Amelia's donated 10 US dollars, so thank you very much. Uh, and we've had David L, who's donated 500 Czech Karuna, uh, and has written, why do you think other charities seem incapable to apply your business model? So things like 24-7 webcams, reaching to us on the social media, the YouTube, much more of the sort of interactivity that we have. Because they're stupid. Um, I don't know, I don't have a business model. I get up every morning, everybody always says to me, what's your plan, what are you gonna do? I have no idea. I'm very reactive to situations. We're proactive to a degree with things we want to do because we just wanna do better and bigger things for our wildlife. Education is absolutely vital now, but we want to do it in an inspiring way so it doesn't feel like a boring lesson, which is why we're doing this brand new project, which will be far more online and on the website probably within a couple of months. Um, yeah, is there a plan? The plan is to do every single thing we can 
do for wildlife and that obviously is always limited by the amount of money we have. Um, I often start my talks when I go out, they say, what's the most important thing in your life? And I say money. And everybody looks at me as if I'm gaga because I'm supposed to say animals and wildlife. We can do all this work, but it takes money to do it. So money comes first. The more money you give us, the more wildlife we can help, the more education we can give, the more we can inspire our kids, to be honest. We have been bad to our children um, insofar as we haven't left this planet in a very good state. I'm talking to people of my age now. Um, but they need to understand, as I think they are, there's some of the movements going now run, well, there's Greta Thunberg, there's Bella Lack, all school age who are really driving this forward. And by them driving it forward, the adults are having to listen at last. I tried for years, I'm obviously far too old to, for anybody to take any notice of, but this movement needs to drive forward and we need to leave something for our children to protect. God, that was getting too philosophical for me. I must, <laughs> I must chill out a bit. I wish I had Bacardi in this and I'd feel better. Uh, so Baron Cattler has asked, do we have 24-7 webcams on the website? And we will say to that, yes, when Laurie remembers to turn them on and switch them off and do things he has to do. Uh, we've got a few. We are aiming to get more webcams on the website, but we're having some technical issues at the moment, which we still haven't resolved. And it's now about 20 weeks later from when we started asking the people to resolve the problem. Um, they are not doing it very well at the moment. We will have more, but we do have 24-7 webcams. The badgers at night, I always still, I mean, I've been doing this for 40 years and I will sit probably most nights for at least 15 minutes and watch the badgers on the webcams. They jump into the pond, they do mad zany things, they chase each other around. It's fascinating to watch. I mean, wildlife is the most magnificent area to spend time. <laughs> Uh, so Strider Winston has asked, what do you think about the possible reintroduction of the lynx, beaver, wolf, etc. into the UK? Yes, good in theory. It would be lovely. Too many years we got all these creatures, we pushed all these creatures out, we either killed them or we drove them out and did bad things to them. I think what people don't think now when they say let's reintroduce these animals into the UK We've got far less habitat than we had then. We've got far more people than we had then. We've got all these idiots who love shooting and trophy hunting and all this other stuff. I think what we should be doing is spending time protecting what we still have left before we lose that as well. Yes, of course, it would be lovely to have more beaver back. It would be lovely to have wolves back. I love that, lynx, whatever. Um, but I think we've gone past this now. I think there's too many people, there's not enough habitat for them and I think we need to protect what we've got rather than try to spend millions of pounds bringing something back which I think would be a bit of a mistake. Yeah, that's quite an interesting one. I just want to say thank you as well to Alice, our office manager, who is diligently uh, policing our comments at the moment. Uh, so some of you may have had your questions answered by Alice, uh, but thank you very much. She's currently up in our reception, both working and uh, managing our live chat. So thank you. Please send us a little message if you'd like to get Alice live next time. Alice will kill me just for saying this, but yeah. she does so much work. She's absolutely, she, she's a little dynamo. And she's only quite little. She's not big, our Alice, but she's like a little whirling dervish. Um, but it would be great if you could meet her and she could speak to you. Um, she will probably kill me for even suggesting it. But if enough of you write in saying you like just two minutes with Alice, she's going to have to do it. She'll bribe the guys. Your comments. Bribe her. Bribe her. Uh, so Linda Fuchs has asked, what is your opinion on the ethics of saving animals that are injured by non-human means? So, for example, a baby bird that's left the nest too soon or anything like that. Um, do you think it could have negative consequences for future generations? That's a big one, to be honest, and something we can't get into it. In, in an hour. I mean, birds might leave the nest too soon because a human interfered. We're never gonna know quite what caused that bird to leave the nest. It might've been knocked by something. It could've been, anything could've happened. But we don't bring those animals in. If a bird leaves the nest too soon, it's probably fledging. And we have a fantastic team of receptionists now with a, a massive wealth of knowledge that we've been writing over many, many years. So when we started Wildlife Aid, anybody found an animal, whatever state, oh, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. We don't anymore. And probably at least, I would say 60% of animals that we would have taken in years ago, we can now talk 
the member of the public through what to do, how to do it. And I think the nicest thing we ever get is sometimes when you finish the call and they're sort of saying, well, you wildlife, they don't care, they didn't take it, whatever. Then you get a call a couple of days later saying, yeah, that was the right thing and I've seen it since and everything's gone. You don't always have to bring an animal into a centre. You just need to give it the right circumstances to survive. If it needs to come in, we'll take it. But sometimes human closeness is not the right thing for it. Uh, many, many more donations already. Uh, I love you all. I love you all. Uh, so I'm going to sing for five minutes. Don't talk. I'm going to sing for it now. <laughs> oh, I'm wow. feeling very, very, very vocal and very, very tuneful. Sorry. Well, everyone's chopping out the chat. Yeah. Can't, I, I don't blame you guys. I don't blame you. <laughs> Uh, Stardust has donated 10 euros as well and has written, I love the work you guys do, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm still scrolling down to try and catch up. Uh, we've had, uh, Yesenia has donated 50 MX dollars. I'm not entirely sure what that is, so I shall have a quick Google. To be honest with the way Brexit's going, every single currency is is equal to, so if, 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 if it's one Czech krona, that's probably worth a pound now. Mm -hmm. Everything's so worth a pound. One yen is worth a pound. is Mexican pesos. That's so probably worth a pound. Much. That's probably worth a pound as well. <laughs> um, Good old Brexit, that's what I say. <laughs> you don't mean it. Uh, <coughs> uh, so, Skull has written, who thinks that Laurie and Abby deserve a raise? Um, I don't know how much they bribe you to say <laughs> that. <laughs> There's two things. It's working for. It's again. It's a wildlife charity. Working for wildlife charity is one thing. Um, do they deserve a raise? Absolutely. Are they going to get one? Absolutely not. The reason being, we never have enough money to do what we want to do already. So you know, we all we all work for love here. Apart from Abby, who hates me, she's really very, 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 very reluctant to come on this tonight. I'll get her across here in a minute. Adam made me promise that she'd speak for five minutes and she's sitting there shaking her head vehemently. Adam's going divorced at this rate. Uh, um, a couple of people are asking how often are the live streams? So our live streams are roughly every four weeks. Uh, by the end of each one, we'll put the date up for the next one. Uh, we try and go every four weeks. We might go every five weeks for the next one, uh, not the next one, the one after that, uh, just to sort of space them out a bit so it's not too early in the month. But it's roughly every four weeks. Sorry, I fell asleep. Laurie was talking for so long, I fell asleep. Sorry, I'll wake up in a minute. Um, Jude Seeker has asked, um, when you have deer that, that you can't help, um, is there a reason that you would shoot it instead of injecting it? Um, yes, we only ever kill when we have to. When, there's the, when that animal definitely cannot survive back in the wild, we will euthanise because... Just imagine if you took every single animal in that could never go back to the wild, we wouldn't have the space to take all the rest of the animals in as well. It sounds hard. Some might think it's callous. It's really not. We have only a, a limited amount of space because we have a limited amount of funds. But we will get anything back, regardless of species, if it can go back. With a big animal like a deer and even some other animals, if we can dispatch it in a way that it can be left out in the wild to go back into the food chain, um, then that's what we'll do because it's it's how animals survive and animals are so there's not as much food out there as there used to be which is why foxes are having to come into to, to urban places so yes we will put an animal back out sometimes we have to inject them in which case we can't but if we can put an animal to sleep humanely and quickly and in fact shooting is actually quicker than injecting or anything else because it's absolutely instantaneous um, then that's what we do. It's a philosophical question to answer. We believe in what we do is right. I'm sure some of you won't, and I'm sorry for that. But we've got to go with our own passion and our own thoughts and the way we think it's right. Other centres will do it other ways, I'm sure. But the animals need food, and if we can supplement that food chain, I think it's putting something back. Uh, so Bunny the Bear has written, congrats on all of the donations. The WAF community is just amazing. I think we'd both agree uh, on that one. Thank you so much for your support. We can only do what we do because of you guys. So thank you very much for your donations. Um, Kanga Kong has asked, how do you access the webcams? 
I don't know. You turn your computer on, you go to the WAF website where it'll say webcams, you click on that, you don't even have to become a member, you just have to register, no, you don't have to now. So as soon as you go into our website, you will see across the top bar webcams, and you click on those, and then you'll be given a choice, and you click on that, and if it's working, that's because Laurie did his job right, and you should see something come up on that webcam. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe we've got all four currently working at the moment, so... Uh, yep, I've posted a link to the website, so you can click on there and have a look. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, Magnetic G, roughly how many animals do you save every year? We deal with about 20,000 wildlife incidents a year. That is not to say all those animals come into the centre, because a lot of it, as I said just now on one of the other questions, can be dealt with on the phone and we tell people what to do, but we deal with 20,000. So that's quite few. I'd like it to be more, but we already work 24-7 and we are already short of volunteers. We're desperately short of volunteers. So anybody who lives in this area, please go onto the website and see if you can join. If you know you can't, See if you can find a friend or somebody down your road who might want to be able to join and come and help us because Alice pulls her hair out at regular intervals. I've had to buy her 55 wigs this year alone because she keeps pulling her hair out. Um, we're short of volunteers, guys, and we've got 300 and over 370 of them. We need more. We need more. So I don't even, I can't remember what the question was now. <laughs> um, I've scrolled past it. Laurie can't either. I thought you'd already... Uh, so we'll move, we'll move straight on. I probably answered it inadvertently. <laughs> uh, apologies in, for that one. In, in my similarity. 20,000 incidents a year. 20, that's it. 20,000 incidents a year. That's the one. I did answer it. <laughs> um, so we've had another donation from Linda Fuchs, which is 75 Danish kroner. Uh, and it's put, thank you for answering her question. Uh, and her next question will be, what is the most memorable rescue you've done? Uh, unfortunately, we have answered that one earlier on. A million times we've answered that. Every rescue to me is memorable. Every time we can save an animal, that will be my most re uh, memorable. I can't speak. My lip and my, my lips and my brain aren't connected tonight. Um, everything's memorable for us. I, I really just are so pleased to be able to help an animal. So whichever one we did the most recently was our most memorable. Uh, so, scrolling down through your comments, guys, there's quite a few here, so uh, apologies if we don't get to yours straight away. We are trying to get through as many of them as we possibly can. Um, I'll sit here and try and get my brain connected to my mouth, because okay. it's just really not connected at all today. <laughs> it's really struggling to keep up. I should have put Bacardi in this coat, shouldn't I? Uh, so, Fancy has written, how do you deal with the grief of losing an animal that you fought so hard for? So maybe it's been a, a really sort of hard operation or we've had it for a number of weeks how hard is that to deal with it's never nice and it's always hard but all you've got to think is you've got to keep going because there'll be another one to save tomorrow there'll be another another creature that needs our help and if we sort of grieve too much we're not going to concentrate on it, it it's a it's a knock but to be honest if you don't get the lows you don't appreciate the highs so if you lived on a sort of a straight line of sort of highs and lows it was just a flat line life would be very boring. I mean, there are some great things happen, there are some foul things happen, but you need both levels to actually appreciate what you've got and where you span out pretty much in the middle of. So it's horrible, um, it's sad, but we know we've done our best and we've just got to get on to the next one. Funny Cat has asked, are the vets always on standby? Uh, do we have people working 24 seven here? Um, we only have one idiot that works 24-7, and he's called Laurie Braley. Um, actually, he doesn't do it. He has a couple of days off a week now. I'm, I'm against this, you know. I, I, for I started giving, giving him Boxing Day afternoon off, <laughs> along with his, with, 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 with his 50p salary, um, but then he started taking more time off. Um, we don't staff the centre 24-7. We have people on duty 24-7, or available for call-outs. Uh, we staff the centre, really, it's actually staffed here from nine in the morning until sometimes midnight, depending on how busy we are, especially this time of year. I often see the volunteers still here beyond half past 11, sometimes beyond midnight. Um, the vet's always on call. Uh, that's Maru, who can't be here tonight, but she's promised to come in on to the next one. Um, we all work hard. We, we all are mad. We're all devoted to what we do. We love what we do. Um, and they put up with me as well, which is pretty much of a miracle, really, because I can be very moody and very bad-tempered. As I get older, it gets worse. Mm -hmm. Be warned. Uh, Last Signa 2 has asked, what's the rarest bird we've ever rescued? 
I don't know. No. We've, we've, had, we've had the European eagle owl. We've had a couple of parrots and parakeets as well. Um, they're mostly pets. I wouldn't have thought anything's very rare here, to be honest. I mean, we rescued siskins and we rescued goldcrests yeah. and we we've, rescued we've all the We've had a couple stuff. of birds that have been blown quite far away. We had a spate last year of kittiwakes. Um, now, kittiwakes are usually more um, sort of on the west coast, but we had, the, due to the winds, they all got blown over. So we had four or five of those at once. Um, we've had great crested grebes in before, um, a couple of chicks of those. So we've had pretty much some things that aren't particularly common, but we still. But not that rare. We've got nothing rare in the UK. UK is not rare. We're just common here in the UK. Uh, another donation from Chantal East, who donated <coughs> four ninety nine uh, in UK pounds, and has put a big thank you for everything you do for our wildlife and for helping her when she made a desperate call about a baby girl last year. So thank you very, very much. I'm glad we were able to help. Thank heavens we were nice to you on the phone. It <laughs> obviously wasn't me on phone duty that night. <laughs> uh, a couple of people are asking, how did you start Wildlife Aid and why? Now, our last live stream, we actually had the first section of that devoted to that question. Um, so, so watch the last live stream is the answer. Uh, we've got a couple of pictures and stuff like that of Simon with hair. That was so a long time ago. Hair and... A slightly smaller tummy, I suggest, too. Tummy's getting a bit big nowadays. Um, while we're just waiting, just having a gap, and Laurie's gone a bit quiet, um, I've got to send my best to Susan and George. I don't know where they're online tonight, but love you both. They're in Canada, the place I'd love to go to. Never been to Canada. There's so much I'd like to see, but it's so huge, I'd have to go for months. But um, I'm watching a TV series about Canada at the moment, and some of the lakes and forests are just magnificent. So... George and Susels, if you're there, good on you. If our if our leatherhead mad lady is here tonight, hello. And this is just for you. I can't say her name because she'd kill me, but I'm going to go. It's me. She'll know who I mean. <laughs> and Bunny the Bear is asked. Bunny the Bear. Will I you... love the names on YouTube. You get some <laughs> most ridiculous names, guys. Will you ever be taking a holiday? Will I ever be <laughs> taking a holiday? You see, I think my life's one big holiday, really. The only time it's not a holiday is when I'm working with Abby and Laurie. Oh, thank no. Um, thank you. Yes, I expect I'll take a holiday one day. But I, I just, I'm getting, um, as I get older, I quite, I feel safe here. It's sort of, it's my little castle in there and I know what I'm doing and I'm in my in my place where I know where everything is. I know where my rescue nets are. I know everything. I'm happy here. Maybe one day, if somebody offered me to go out to Zambia on a, a personal safari, I think I'd be gone like a shot. <laughs> uh, so Funny Cat has asked, do we make merchandise? Uh, we do on our website. We do have a shop. Uh, it's got a couple of sort of stationary bits. And you can buy the Wildlife Aid polo shirts and jackets. And my book. Uh, and Simon's, bo both of Simon's books. books, both his and autobiography books. and his uh, children's book, The Owl with the Golden Heart. And my books. Um, we also will be having the t-shirts that you can see us wearing in the rescue videos appearing uh, fairly soon on there as well. We do a bit of merchandise. It doesn't make us lots of money, but um, it's, it's good to spread the word. Um, merchandise isn't big for us, sadly. Um, the thing that is big for us, which is the thing which I always get shout at when I mention, and that is legacies. Um, legacies are really important, and that's what makes a charity get big in the end. So think about it, guys. I'm going to leave it at that. But donations are amazing. Memberships are amazing. And legacies are absolutely vital to any medium-sized charity. Let's move swiftly on, shall we? Yvonne uh, has asked uh, if we're ever in need of new lab equipment. Oh, funny you should say that, young lady. Was it lady? Yeah, Yvonne. Um, Yvonne. I don't, Yvonne, I don't know whether you're in the veterinary world or the medical world, but we've got a veterinary, I think it's called an IDEX stat spin. We've now got three of them because they've all broken and we're trying to make one out of three and we can't do that. So if you get a centrifuge, we need to, uh, to centrifuge, we need to spin our bloods down. Um, the stat spin is the one that everybody uses. I'm not very good on the technicalities of these things, but one of those, if anybody knows a vet who's got an old stat spin in their cupboard, please think of us because we have no working stat spins at the moment. We have three that don't work, which is not the right answer. So yeah, and any medical equipment, to be honest, we always need syringes, we need needles. To be honest, pretty much anything we use, I think we used, we worked it out the other day, we used 
thousands and thousands of one mil syringes a year, obviously swabs, anything in the medical line, disposables particularly, but obviously kit as well. I mean, good microscopes are always useful. I mean, just ring us. I'm not saying we're going to take it all, but if you've got something, if you could offer it to us, we'll obviously give you a very fast answer and it could be a lifesaver for us. So thank you. <laughs> uh, we've had £10 donation from Scottish Astronomer who has asked, um, did Laurie see any otters in the Shetland? And if so, has Simon forgiven him yet? Oh, this is going to be very... I'm going to let you have Laurie for five minutes. He's going to swap places oh, with me no. and he can talk about his... B-L-O-O-D-Y otters. <laughs> Here he comes. To He'll bore you. Sit. You'll fall asleep. I'm going to count yeah, how, very how many people man. fall asleep. Go on. You can have three minutes, actually, Laurie, on otters. And then time you starting Hello. now. We've got three minutes on otters. So for those of you who didn't know, um, earlier in July, I went to Shetland for a week uh, with my partner to photograph otters. Um, I have to say it was incredible. The weather was terrible. It rained both days. So that's right. There. Um, but we had a number of sightings of otters, seals, puffins, um, great skewers, cormorants, you name it, it was there. Um, I've had an awful lot of photos. If you actually saw the, um, the holding card at the beginning of this video of the otter, that is one of my pictures. Uh, I have a lot more, but I'm not allowed to post them on here because it's considered advertising. Um, so for those of you who are interested, you can find them, just Google my name and you'll find a password a way into it somewhere. But it was absolutely incredible. So thank you to those of you who are asking how that was. Uh, that was really, really good. And I want to go back. I really want to go back, but I'm trying to get the time off. Okay, that's your three minutes. Okay. Go away. Three minutes. Go away. Bye. Go away. Three minutes. What Laurie didn't say on that, guys, was he actually took 33,000 pictures of otters <laughs> while he was in Shetland. I did not. Only three of them were in focus. So <laughs> that's, that's more a, a you thing, isn't that's it? That's a wildlife. Ooh, that's a wildlife photographer for you. That's another pay decrease for Laurie. <laughs> right, bang us another question, guys, because we're getting a bit near the end now. Uh, yep, so keep I'm vanishing. Can I pick up my watch? Now. Here we go. Abby, fire us something. Somebody say something to me. It's all gone very quiet, guys. Um, Lucy's asked, uh, Simon, I've never heard you play the trumpet. Could you do it on the next live stream? It would blow all the speakers, and it would blow my mind. And... Yes, I haven't played that for a long time, actually. I did play it about a year ago for about three minutes and decided I was far too old. So um, for Lucy, if you make me a million pound donation, I will play my trumpet on the next live stream. <laughs> so over to you, all I can say. And I want to watch, if you do write that check, I'd like to watch Sean's face and video it as you write it. Thank you. <laughs> Um, a few people are asking how, um, if they can volunteer just for a few days as a normal UK resident. Uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult because we, we love volunteers, we need volunteers, but what you need is regular commitment for two reasons. One, in there's quite a lot of training to go through and you know you can't sort of go and do it all on day one, there's quite a lot to learn. So we'd get a lot of non-UK people. They either come over for a sort of a month or three months or four months. We had a couple of guys over from um, Holland this spring who were absolutely brilliant. I think they stayed with us for about three or four months, didn't they? Uh, yeah, quite yeah, a long time, time actually. Incredible. Lars and Rachel. Rachel. Lars and Rachel, how are you both? Um, so the answer, to be honest, is as a non-UK resident, no, you can't because it's not gonna do you any good, to be honest. It's not gonna do us any good. And we love training people up, we love getting you up to a standard so you might even go home and run your own wildlife hospital. But we just don't have the time to teach somebody who we know is not going to be of any use to us and probably not going to use those skills again in the future. So it might sound mean and horrible, but as I get older I get more mean and more horrible. <laughs> a couple more donations. So Ironics One has donated £9.99 in pounds and has written, thank you for all the generous work you all do. Uh, what's the best way forward if you come across a large injured animal, something like a fallow deer, uh, to try and calm it down and keep the stress levels down? Um, if it's a very big animal like a red deer, you ring Laurie, <laughs> because I'm going to make sure I'm out, because they are ginormous. Um, any large animal, there's two tricks. One, if, you can, if it's on a road, obviously, try and protect it with your vehicle, put your vehicle behind it, put your hazard lights on, don't endanger yourself, whatever you do and stay clear of it. We see too many people either go and cuddle it or they put a blanket over it. It's only gonna stress it out, guys. 
it's in enough trouble, it doesn't want to be an extra human, which it's probably never been in its entire life. If you can protect it and keep it safe by sitting a distance back and stop other cars hitting it, fantastic. But for any large animal like that, ring a wildlife centre, ring your nearest wildlife hospital, because they will have the kit and the experience to deal with it. Fallow deer are pretty big. I think we've, we haven't done that many. We had two quite a few years back now, which were stuck in a in a sports net in in a school. There were two of them, and they were they you know when they're trying to get out of that, you have to be really careful. We had five or six volunteers, and it was real nail biting stuff because they would they could kill you not intentionally, but they could kill you by thrashing around with their antlers and their feet. So yeah, be careful if it's a big animal. Protect it, but don't go too close. Um. Ishan Gupta has asked, um, with the young animals, how do you feed them through the night? How are they fed through the night? You have to have a certain degree of insanity because we have to ask our volunteers to get up probably every two hours to feed the young animals. Obviously not birds. Birds feed dawn till dusk, so it's the same habits that you have in the wild, so birds stop at dark. But with mammals, they, when they're very young, they need feeding every two or three hours in the night. Um, a very special milk and as they get older they have a slightly different recipe to that milk to keep them going. It's very hard work. I mean some of our volunteers might take five or six baby hedgehogs home and by the time you've fed the sixth one it's a bit like the fourth bridge where you have to start feeding the next one again. So it is very time consuming. Again when you're feeding very young things like this there's a lot of skill. You can overfeed them. You can do all sorts of things wrong. So there's a lot of training to be able to feed the very young babies and again a lot of devotion and a lot of love. Uh, so Sculptor has asked, uh, do animals sometimes understand that they're being rescued and cooperate? And if so, do you have any stories of which ones? Honest answer, I've no idea. Gut feeling, is, yeah, I think they do. I think they know things are going on. I think they know that, that things are happening. Like when we had the fire and we were putting pigeons in with foxes, literally. I mean, that's a recipe for disaster but nothing ate anything else that night. I think animals know when you're trying to help them. Some don't, I'm sure, but I think some of the time they just know that they can't do anything about it and maybe this mad person that they've never seen before can actually help them. So I like to think they do, I think they do. I think animals have probably more sentience than we've got actually. Um, that takes me back to politics, so let's not go there. <laughs> Uh, so Ishank Gupta has asked, why don't we use electric vehicles? If, any, if you want to buy me a Tesla, I very happily accept it. Um, there's so much debate we could have on electric vehicles and green power and all this sort of thing, and it is far too long for now. Um, we need to get to rescues quite quickly. We need to make sure we could probably be out for six hours non-stop on a rescue or going from rescue to rescue and they're not reliable enough for that at the moment either. I'm sure the whole country will be into or have to have electric vehicles within a not too long period of time. Um, and obviously it's all about batteries. But when you look at the sustainability of batteries, I know that it's all very green, but if you're buying batteries every three or four years for a vehicle, it's a big debate. I would love to get to the bottom of this, of this debate because I just wonder what is the most environmentally friendly of all these things and how it works. Not a subject for now, but as I say, if anybody wants to buy me a Tesla, I'm sure I could manage to squeeze into it. But it's got to be an estate, guys, remember. It's got to be an estate car, which takes a lot of kit. <laughs> A couple of people were asking previously roughly how many rescues we do. Uh, and interestingly enough, if you are looking at Alice in the live chat, she said we might actually have a deer rescue to go out to once we uh, finish this live <coughs> chat. So that's still, uh, still waiting, but we might have to run off. Rescues, you can do none a day, you can do six a day, you never know. I mean, you get, there's no rhyme or reason to any of our rescues. They can be day and night. Absolutely no idea, but as I say, we've probably got a rescue going on in the background now. Um, by the time they've got all the details and everything we need to know, we'll be rushing off from here in about probably a couple of three minutes when our hour comes to an end um, to go and do a rescue. Uh, a couple more donations, this is why we're here. Scottish astronomer has donated another £10 uh, and has written, and I still say rocket science is much easier than what you do. And yes, he worked for the ESA, the European Space Agency. Um, and yes, the rockets do blow up, but they're miles away and not trying to catch it on a catapult. 
just look at the stars and tell me what the future holds for us because it's quite interesting. I'd love to be able to come back in 200 years time and have a look to see what the state of the earth. I'm not sure I'd want to see really, but what an interesting philosophical discussion we could have on that young man. Uh, uh, Stephen Forex has also donated five pounds and has written, hi guys, have you ever done any mink rescues? Now mink are a bit of a controversial species here, aren't they? We only get the North American mink in the UK. Um, and sadly, it's because they've been released from mink farms. We are, by law, not allowed to release them. Um, and so, really, we have no choice but to put them to sleep. And to be honest, when we get mink, they're usually so, usually so badly damaged that they would have to be put to sleep anyway. But I hate putting anything to sleep, to be honest. It's real sad. They're beautiful creatures, but if you think of mink in its life, we'll probably over three or four thousand of our British birds or animals of some sort, um, which is why their class is invasive. And it was all because sort of people let them go out of mink farms because they thought they were doing them a favor. <sighs> Again, that's another, we're getting very philosophical tonight. That's another big debate, far too big to be had on YouTube tonight. Mm -hmm. I have another donation from Gooey, he's donated uh, five euros and has written keep up the good work. So thank you very much for that one. Uh, and a couple of questions. What should you give a hedgehog to eat if you're trying to sort of feed them in the garden or encourage them into the garden? Uh, this time of year, unless it's very dry, unless it's very unpleasant, I don't advocate feeding any wild animal unless there's a reason for it. If it's very ill, it might need a bit of support feeding. Um, if it's been very dry, it might need support feeding. So don't feed them anything if you don't have to. Let them find their own food. If you get a very inclement spell in the winter, the same thing, only feed them when you have to. And for hedgehogs, it would be sort of tinned cattle dog food, preferably not a fish variety, and some small dry cat biscuits because they need to keep their teeth clean as well. So you could feed them that if you have to. But again, you know, wildlife, you know, it's, it's got a lot more savvy than you give it credit for. It will usually find its own food, apart from when we get these extreme climactic conditions, which I think probably can become more of a thing of the future and more frequent, sadly. <laughs> uh, I just had a question in my head and I've completely forgotten it. Um, See, Laurie's turning <laughs> to me, but I luckily am. we've got Abby to keep us going. <laughs> Emily Patsendale um, has asked if you, if you do any talks, if you are able to... <clears throat> I am happy to do talks. I'm, I'm very mercenary, so I, give, I do after-dinner talks. I do talks to groups of any age, to be honest. Um, in fact, I'm doing one in a church in a couple of months' time, so I've got to be very good and on my best behaviour for that one. Um, I'm happy to do after dinner speaking. Obviously, we need a donation for it, and it takes me away from here, so it has to be worth the cent as well. Not worth my while, I hasten to add, but it's got to be worth it for the centre for me to be away for some considerable time and pay the expenses of being away. I love doing after dinner talks. I am a bit like Marmite. Some people will love them, and some people will try to usher me out the door inside five minutes. But... With me, you get it unabridged. I will say what I feel. You might not agree. That's always your prerogative. Um, we both know where the door is if it comes to that, but I'm sure it won't. <laughs> I shall push by Cam, who is also quite a regular here. He's donated two pounds and has put every little help. Sorry I'm late to the live Q&A. So great to see you again. Thank you very much. Uh... We're just going back through some of the questions that were submitted in our original video. We've had a lot in tonight, so uh, we're still trying to catch up. Um, what's your, the worst injury that you've ever had from a rescue, apart from the broken rib? <coughs> apart from the broken that wasn't <laughs> the worst injury. I think I've never had any serious injury at all. I mean, I've been bitten on the thumb by a badger, and it took about a year to get the feeling back in the thumb because it was quite severe. I've had an antler in the neck, I've had an antler in the forehead, and I've blood everywhere. But again, I've never had a serious injury, to be honest. Uh, I've been lucky, I'm just touching wood like crazy because as I get older it's more likely to happen. So nothing that serious as yet. Guys, we're on our hour and I'm very conscious that yeah. we've got a rescue to go yes, to. Yeah. So guys, we will, if you've got any questions left, keep asking them because we'll just feed them into the, in the one next month. Um, we're going to see you again at 7 o'clock on the... The, uh, the 4th, I believe, or the 5th. Uh, it's on the end board. I thought we just, changed it. No, middle. no, no. It's... Uh, so it's September the 4th, they 2019, at 7 o'clock. We'll have an argument um, about this so later on. So it's in on. four weeks' time. He's still talking, but I'm not listening to him. Um, I'm not sure I can do it anyway. We'll see. Um, so we'll see you in about a month's time. Okay. That may change. Give us questions. Say. Any comments you've got, any questions you have about what we do or anything to help. We're always here, guys. We're 24-7. Bang us an email. 
um, we are always here. Any ideas for fundraising would just be beyond amazing because it's terrible. It, yes, it is. It's all about the money. But all about the money means we can save more, more wildlife at the end of the day. So on that note, I'm going to sign off with a huge thanks to everybody for coming in and watching. A massive thanks for all the donations, which we will work out later on and let you know how much we raised tonight. I just think if every view paid us a pound, that would be pretty damned amazing. And Laurie's pointed to a piece of paper saying, I was special man. Okay, Nigel Grant. Nigel, what, a, what an institution this man is. He sold, sold stamps on our behalf for a year up at a market in London, and he raised £10,000. Nigel, you're a star. I hope this year's fundraising goes well for you. Um, sadly, it's not for us, and I'll never forgive you for that, but never mind. Um, and don't forget the webcams, badgers, tawny owls, ducklings, and gulls. Not seagulls, I hasten to add. And I'm going off, guys, on a rescue. See you in a month's time.